is not right, which was evil, the Bible says God will burn all those works and you will not receive any reward in the presence of God. It is a fearful thing to fall in the presence of God, in the hand of God. And we should not take anything lightly. Ask this question to yourself, whatever I'm doing right now, is it worth it? Whatever am I doing, will that bear fruit? When I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, Will that count? Because there are two things that is important. Fear God and keep His commandments. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You see, we, we fear Him because we love Him. We keep His commandments because we love Him. Jesus made it very clear. If you love me, you will keep my words. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The question that you and I should ask, do I really, really love God? Do I really love God the way that I ought to love Him? Do I really keep the commandment of God by loving God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength? Do I really love Him? Do I keep His commandment? Do I love my neighbor enough to tell him the truth that he may not end up in hell? Do I love him? No, I don't want to hurt him, so I'm not telling him the gospel. That is not calling love. Actually, you're destroying his soul. If somebody's house is burning, you're not going to say, you know what, if I tell him his house is burning, he will feel bad. I will keep quiet. <laughs> You'll be screaming on top of your voice and saying, hey, your house is burning. Isn't it? And your neighbor is on the way to hell. How can you keep quiet? True love will try to rescue the parish. True love. Bible says that, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. That's what will count at the end of the day. Do you fear God? I don't fear God because He is an angry God going to keep me in hell. No, no, no. I fear him because I love him so much. I don't want to hurt him. That's kind of fear. True love casteth away fear. True love casteth away fear. Fear of what? Fear of people. What will people think if I trust in Christ? That kind of fear. What will my society, all oh, my friends will throw me out of this circle. Oh, they, they will think I'm like, I'm a holy guy now. And so, people fear their friends more than God. The Bible says, true love, cast without fear. The love for God, true love for God will say, I don't care about this world. I love God and I fear Him, not the world. And so when you love God, that fear that you have of the world goes out of you. There are two things that will matter. And you should live for this. You and I should live for this. Because we want to be judged. Every idle words that proceed out of your mouth will be judged. 
You'll give an account for every idle word that you see. For God shall bring every work into judgment. Every work, whatever you do. You do good work, God will bless you for your good work by judging you. So judging does not mean always negative. Judging means he puts you in a, in a judgment scale and says, okay, this is great. I judged him, he's, he's doing a good thing, I will reward him for that. Many a time we think like, judgment, God is going to judge me. Yes, thank God he's going to judge me because he's going to praise me for what I'm going to do for him. Thank God that God will judge us because he's not going to do partiality. Amen? He will judge us so he can reward us. He will judge us so he can praise. The Bible says, every man will receive praise from God. If you are saved, you will receive praise from God. At least for one reason, for trusting in Him. And so, see, God says, hey, don't live like, you know, people think like, when I go to church, I should not smile. When I go to church, I should be quiet. This is not a Catholic church. It's all about the traditions. And so I should not say Amen. I should not shout Hallelujah. I should not be raising my hands in worship. No, we are set free. To rejoice in God. Amen? He says rejoice. It means you can pull your chin and smile broad. Amen? Amen? Sometimes some Christians walk into church as if they are carrying 150 kg of cement upon them. No smile, no joy, no nothing. But why? Maybe because of the difficulties of life. Maybe because of what has happened. But one thing, dear friend, I want to tell you. That God says that when you cast your burden upon me, I will give you rest. Don't carry it. You know the secret of being happy as a Christian is this. Having an attitude of this like, I know what I'm going through, but God is in control, He's going to take care of it. Sometimes just that is sufficient in life. I know what I'm going through, I know it's, it's very hard, but God is in control and He's going to take care of it. When you just say that to yourself, comfort yourself in these words, and put your faith and trust in God, you know God smiles and says, Look at that faith. I like that kind of faith. Let us not carry the burden which God wants to carry to make our life light and happy. We are actually carrying too many burdens for no reason. And God says, no, I don't want you to carry burden. I just want you to fear me and I want you to keep my commandment I will take care of the rest of the things. I'll care, care of it. I'll take care of it. Amen? Just know one thing is, God is in control of your life, dear friends. And He is able to give you rest. He says, all you that labor and are heavy burden, all you that labor and are heavy burden, come unto me. And what I will do, I will give you rest. And this has become my faith. Lord, I can't carry this anymore. I need rest. I know you are in control. And God says, I like that kind of faith when they believe that I am able to do that in their life. 
Many a times we think like, how can God do this? Can I just tell God everything alone? This is too small for him. This is too big. Oh yeah. The God of the mountain is still the God of the valleys. Amen. The God of the big thing is still the God of the small things. That's not caring about it. It's just come on to me. Only that labor and a heavy burden, I'll give you rest. You just feel me and keep my commandments. I want you to rejoice in this world. I want you to rejoice for the things that you have. How many of us really rejoice over the things that we have? Many times if we have 10 things, if we don't have 1 things, we sort over the things that we don't have and we forget to rejoice over the things that we have. Am I right? Yes. Very true, dear friends. I think we need to start changing our attitude. Amen? Yeah. That's why you know Paul says, be yeah. not conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewing of your mind, change your thinking. Change your thinking. Man, I wish today I can have that. But what about the things that you have? Are we thankful to God for it? We literally go into sorrowfulness because we fail to live a life of gratitude. When we are not grateful to God, sorrow creeps in our heart. You know, a grateful Christian will be joyful Christian. Keep that in mind. A grateful Christian will be a joyful Christian. Because what well, grateful means Lord, be thankful. And so he's thankful to God for all that God has given him, that he has, and that he's possessing. And so he's rejoicing now. And God says, that is exactly what I want you to do. Rejoice for all that you have. Do with all the strength that you have, the things that you can. Rejoice. I had a guy who came to me and said, Sir, you know, I need some money, sir. I need some money. I said, why? I want to buy a phone, sir. I want to buy a phone. I'm like, what phone do you want? I want iPhone, sir. Why? 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 Why do you want iPhone? Sir, everybody's having iPhone. I just have Samsung. What? <laughs> what? And Samsung is a good company. You see, you know what happened? He's enjoying, he, he has a good thing, but he's not thankful for what he has. He's not having great sorrow because he did not have iPhone. That is called stupidity. The height of idiot. Not being thankful for what you have. Because when you covered, sorrow comes in you. And God says, hey, didn't I promise you that I am a God that will supply all your needs? What do you want your iPhone for? When you can do most of your work with the Samsung. You want photos, selfies, you want to chat, you want to send emails, text me. you can do that. And this, it's a great form. But no, sir, I won't because all my friends have that thing. And somehow I did not give him money. And somehow he found out some from somebody. He got him money, he bought an iPhone. And then the third day later he broke. And more sorrow. <laughs> more sorrow! And 
God says rejoice, oh young man. You know what God actually thinks? God thinks every Christian is a young person. Only those who wait upon the Lord. Only those who wait. Every Christian is a young Christian. Only those who wait upon the Lord. You say, how is that, Pastor? The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, they that wait upon the, upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen? Rejoice! I have a headache, Pastor. Rejoice because you have a head. Imagine you are walking in the city without a head. <laughs> You know, my leg hurts me. I have a leg, my, my leg hurts me. But I have, I have every reason to complain. My leg, my leg hurts, oh man, so bad. I have to stand and teach for so many hours every, every day. But I can rejoice that I have legs and I can walk. Because there are people who cannot walk. And God says, rejoice! Because when you're not grateful, you're not fearing God because you're hurting. You're saying, God, you didn't do a good job on me. But actually God did. Rejoice, oh young man. Rejoice. Thank God for all that you have. And the things that you don't have, you wait upon the Lord. If you need it, if God thinks that is what you need, God will give it to you. But don't pile up sorrow for the things that you don't have. That's a waste life to live in this world. Isn't it? Living a sorrowful life? Oh, I don't have it. I, will, I, can, I can say, oh man, I wish I had a church building, you know, I wish I had a church building with a big sign and I would, I'd be having hundreds of people every Sunday and that is true. But if I always think about it, I will not rejoice over the cloud that God has given me to hear the preaching of God's word every Sunday after Sunday. Amen? And I will rejoice and thank God for everyone sitting here in Margo, in Port Marim, that they come to hear the word of God and I rejoice in the Lord for it. Or I can say, I wish I had a church building. I wish I had a church building. Thank God we have a place to worship. Thank God we have families in the church. Thank God for all that God has given us to worship Him. We have many reasons to thank Him. Can I tell you something? We have more reasons in this world to thank the Lord and be rejoicing than be sorrowful. The problem is we forget that and we exhort the things that we don't have. Maybe one or two or three. And we say, oh, I don't have that. I wish I had that. And we make our life a little bit sorrow. There are people who are sorrowful because they are not married. There are people who are so sorrowful for marriage. But you can thank God that you are married. Or you can be rejoicing that you are not married. Amen? Thank God I didn't marry. Rejoice. Or thank God I am married. Rejoice. There are reasons that you can be grateful to God. Thank God for children. Oh man, that my children are terrible. You can be sorrowful or you can be thankful. God says, be thankful. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. Amen? Amen. A thankful Christian will be a rejoicing Christian. A grateful Christian will reject sorrow from his life. Refuse to be sorrowful, dear friends. Resist the devil who brings sorrow in your life. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will feel, flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you.
Some people will say, Pastor, oh, my children, man. Oh, they're throwing this down, breaking that. Thank God, they make your life so exciting every day. Amen? You know, I was, ex I was wishing, oh, all the wall in my house is going to be clean. I'm not going to allow my kids to paint. I'm not going to allow them to <laughs> And I, now, like, they're the painters. My house is all painted. Now, you know, I, I saw it. I'm like, oh, man, what the boss will say. The owner of the house will say, or I can rejoice. My children are getting excited and they're learning some new things. And when they're grown up, I will paint and keep it clean. I have reasons to rejoice. Or I can say, man, what, what kind of kids I have? Look at them, my walls are all dirty. I can be sorrowful, or I can rejoice that my children are able to pick up colors and draw it on the wall. Amen? They are learning. They are learning something new. And God says, hey, rejoice in this world. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. I keep a glass on the table, my son comes and throws it down and breaks it. You can either be sorrowful for that glass broken or you can rejoice and you can buy a new set of glasses. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving you ideas to rejoice. Because we have so much thing in this world which actually does not matter. But we sorrow over it because we don't have it. Actually, we can thank God for the things that we have. And God says, hey, rejoice. Rejoice. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee. The... Because one day that you are going to stand before the Lord for judgment, and God is going to judge you. For... God is going to say that. I appreciate you so much. But no doubt that for all these things, for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore remove sorrow from thy heart. Verse number 10. Remove sorrow from your heart. Refuse to be sorrowful. You want to be sorrowful over something? Be sorrowful over your sin, dear friend. I don't like that what I did. I hurt God. I grieved God. I'm sorrowful over it. And Bible says, Godly sorrow bringeth repentance. Amen? Amen. Godly sorrow. Sorrowful over sin because you grieve God. And when you grieve God, when you're sorrowful, God brings joy because you're sorrowful. God gives you repentance and says, it's okay, I forgive you. I cleanse your sin. Continue to rejoice. Remove sorrow from your life. And I didn't, I shouldn't have said those things. I said those things. And you carry on for months and weeks and years. Why don't you go and get said that right and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And then be joyful. Or all your life, be sorrow. And God says, remove sorrow from thy heart. And put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. Too many times like, I'm such a young man, I want to enjoy this world. But basically when he says, I want to enjoy this world, means he wants to go drink, drunk and fornicate. That's what he basically says. And God says, no, no, no. Throw away the evil things. Remove sorrow from your heart. Because the sins of this youth and child is vanity. It's empty. It will leave you sorrowful. You want to rejoice? I mean, live, live 12 hours a day when you're awake and working on this earth, walking around. Make a decision today. I am making a decision by committing my life to the Lord to live a holy life. Being helpful, thankful, grateful every day. And that 12 hours when you have finished, you can rejoice. See, what wow, today, 
I was able to live life glorifying the Lord. I didn't commit sin today. When temptation, no, no, remember, temptation is not sin. Temptation is not sin. Many a time, I'm tempted. And then you're sorrowful over your temptation. In fact, God says, rejoice! When you are tempted. Did God say that? Or did I just say it? Let's say it in what the book of James says. But book of James says, count it all joy when you are tempted. Right? James chapter 1. So temptation is not sin. Verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. James chapter 1. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and entice. Now in verse number 2, James chapter 1. Verse number 2, James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Falling into temptation is not sin, but committing it is sin. You understand it? Every day we fall into sin. You may be walking around, you see a big, big billboard with a woman with all this, and, and, and it's very easy for a young man to be Either you can fall into sin by lusting after her, or you can say, what is that stupid woman? Doesn't even have a sense. And you just keep going. And thankful for the women that God has put in your life who are godly and well. There are many temptations in this world, but temptation is not sin. But committing it, Yielding yourself to that sin, to that temptation is sin. See, God says you can walk up to this place, but don't walk on the edge. Enjoy your life. He says there's so much reason to enjoy in this world. And so God says, let us hear the conclusion. He says, hey, don't make your life a burden. I want you to rejoice. Don't carry this burden on your head while you're living on this earth. I put you here so you can rejoice in the Lord. Paul is writing rejoice in the Lord in the book of Philippians when he's imprisoned. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice. Why? He refused to be sorrowful. If you want to be rejoicing, you can rejoice anywhere, at any circumstances. Yes, dear friends. Even in the deepest, painful circumstances. Even though it is hard, and say, Lord, I don't know how to rejoice you. This is too hard for me to bear. I don't know what I, why are you putting me in these situations. But Lord, I can say one thing. While I don't understand anything, you are still in control. And when this is done and over, only good will come out of it. And that is always dear friend. When you go through fire, you will always come refined and purified. Amen? Silver and gold will never shine unless and until it is put in the fire and refined seven times. Maybe it is easy for me to say it in this way and I, uh, you might be going through a tough time in life. I'm just trying to comfort you today. Because in these comforting words there are great truths. Because when you say those things to yourself and put your trust in God, God rejoices and say like, my son, my daughter, you're going through such things and, and I can see what you're going through but your faith is in me and I'm so grateful. I'm going to turn your world upside down. That is the day that's going to come. 
Weeping may endure for a season, but joy cometh in the morning. Amen. It is coming. It is coming. You do two things in life which is important. Don't do unnecessary things, that's not important. Because when you do unnecessary things in this life, you're carrying burdens on you. One is fear God. Fear God because you'll love Him. You know, I love my kids, I love my family. I don't want to do anything that will hurt them. So I fear them. I don't fear them because they want to kill me. I fear them because I love them. And I want, I don't want to do things that will grieve their heart. That kind of fear I'm talking about. I want you to know how God is not with a sword waiting to chop your head the moment you sin. You know why you're alive today in this place and sitting right now here yesterday you committed sin and yes and still God has kept you here because His mercy endureth forever. Amen? We have a merciful God. Forgiving God. Tender, compassionate God. Make a decision today. Lord, I want to fear you. Because I love you. I will put you first in my life. You know, oh, my work, my this, my sports, my this and that. And God said, at the end of the day, what? Did you fear me? Did you put me first in life? Because me being dead is the most important thing. Because God says, it's a... It, Psalm 131 Is it Psalm 131? Oh, Psalm 127 Except the Lord build the house They labor in vain that build it Except the Lord keep the city The watchman walk, wake and but in vain It is waiting for you to rise up early. To sit up late. To eat the bread of sorrows. You know many of the people, you know I'm working so hard because of you. Why do you work hard? You're eating, yeah, every time you say that, you're eating the bread of sorrow. I'm doing this because of you. And God says, it is waiting for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrow. For so he giveth his beloved, what? So God's people will be joyful people. God's people will be, you know God says, I give you rest, give you sleep, peaceful mind. <coughs> Lord, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his cure full of them. They shall not be ashamed, for they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. There are reasons to rejoice. You put God first, dear friend. Don't try to build your own kingdom without God. Don't try to achieve success without God. Now, is it possible? Absolutely. You can achieve success in this world without God. You can become extremely rich without God. You can become extremely popular in this world without God. But at the end of the day, you will all be just that, a vapor. And people will cry over you for a week or two and then they forget you. But that which is done for the Lord will never be forgot forgotten, never will be destroyed. People will remember you for it. God will reward you for it. Let your life be surrounded. You know, people can, you know, you know what? It is a good criticism 
when people will criticize you for saying the guy thinks the Bible is all that he has. The guy thinks too much about his Bible. He thinks too much about his church. That's a good criticism. If somebody is criticizing you because you believe in God, that's a good criticism. You should consider that as a compliment. Amen? Amen. That's a compliment from the devil. You're like, no, 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 you're always with the Bible. You're always, always about church, always about God. Thank God somebody is noticing your testimony. Amen? Amen. There you have a reason to rejoice. Thank God somebody is noticing your testimony. Put God first in your life. Fear God. And keep His commandments. Do you keep His commandments? Loving Him. With all your strength. With all your mind. With all your soul. With all your heart. Love your neighbors. Because God says, hey, these are the two greatest commandments I give unto you. These are the two greatest commandments I give unto you. All other commandments hangs upon these. I will read this again and finish it here. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Conclusions of your life. At the end of the day, what really matters in your life, dear friend? What really matters? And you know who wrote this? One of the wisest men in the world. Solomon, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he, say, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Because when you fear God, you will have wisdom. Amen? Amen. Give me fear, wisdom, Lord. God says, fear me. People need wisdom. But you get wisdom by fearing God. You don't need a prophet to come and say, I declare wisdom on your life. No, no. God says, go, read your Bible. I said, if you fear me, I will give you wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen? Amen. Now just fear me. If you want wisdom, fear me. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So ask yourself, the extra that you are trying to do, is it really important? The extra that you are trying to do without doing this, is it really important in life? Without God. Sunday is the only day when we remember God. Is that really important? Do we really fear God every day? Do we really keep His commandments every day? Do we really love Him and His work every day? Are we really involved in His work? Are we really involved in His work? In some way or the other. Say at the end of the day, these two are the things that will really matter in life. Fear God and keep His commandment. You know the commandment of God is what? That you will repent and be saved if you are not saved. If you are not saved, you repent of your sin, you realize that you cannot save yourself, you realize that you are no good. You realize your beliefs are false and turn to Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You turn to Jesus Christ who says, I am the eternal life. I will come in you and abode in you forever. 
If you will trust and receive Jesus Christ, you shall have eternal life. That's the commandment, the first commandment. The ultimate commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. When you're saved, and you put God first in everything. Don't ask this question, whatever am I doing, will this bring glory to God? If the Spirit of God tells you no, then don't do it. God has put that voice in your heart, dear friend. When God will convict your con con conscience, you can ask yourself, will this bring glory and honor to God? And God will say to you, no. And God will say to you, yes. If it really brings glory and honor, then do it. And live rejoicingly. God wants you to rejoice in this world. But not doing evil things, but by doing the right thing. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. At the end of the day, whether you are good or bad, whether you trusted Christ or not, everyone will be judged. With every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be God is going to judge. One thing is, if you are a child of God, you will be judged and be praised for trusting Christ. Amen? If you are a child of God, you will be judged and be rewarded for the life that you live here on earth for Christ. Amen? If you have not trusted Christ, God is not pleading to you, but may I plead to you that you will not delay. Not because God is longing for you, but I don't want you to go to hell. And Christ became, God became man and died for you. By shedding his precious blood, he was buried and he rose again on the third day. The Bible says, if you will trust him, he will save you. He will give you reasons to rejoice. He will give you peace, eternal life. Amen. Shall we pray?